Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Zeno of Alea is a pre-Socratic philosopher best known for his paradoxes of motion. He was a student of Parmenides, who was a monist who held that everything is one, that being and thought are identical or the same, and that motion or change was actually an illusion. And what we learn from Plato's Parmenides from the introduction of it is that Zeno also wrote a treatise, and his treatise was defending Parmenides' point of view, but doing it by way of trying to show that any assumption that motion or change really exists or takes place leads us into paradoxes. That is, it leads us into contradictions, uh, things that don't seem to make sense. Now, we unfortunately don't have Zeno's treatise. It's supposed to have contained a number of different arguments. But we do have the reconstructions available from later philosophers who were largely criticizing Zeno for these paradoxes that he's presenting. And among them is Aristotle, uh, who tells us uh, you know, quite a bit about why these are wrong and what the problem is, which we'll get to in just a moment. But he also lays out for us what the paradoxes are supposed to be. And they're kind of ingenious, so you might want to think about them a little bit and ponder them before you immediately say, oh, that, that doesn't work at all. And just let the paradox itself sink in. So there, there's four of them, the dichotomy, it's usually called, the Achilles, sometimes called Achilles and the tortoise, the arrow and the stadium. All of them are intended to show that if you assume that motion exists, we're going to be led into some sort of problem. So the conclusion should be that, well, motion doesn't really exist. So the dichotomy is fairly straightforward. Imagine that you have to traverse some sort of area, and it's finite in length. So you have to go from here to the train station, or you need to cross the room, or you just need to cross this portion of chalk on the chalkboard. So in order to get there, you have to go at least halfway. So we can mark out a halfway point. Good job, you're already halfway there, right? That's the good news. Now the bad news is you can do the same thing for every other part of this interval. So, you know, you've made it halfway, you can go three quarters of the way. Wow, you're really making a lot of progress. And now you can divide that portion further, and now you've got seven-eighths. And we go on and on and on. And Zeno's argument says you never actually reach the final limit point because for any interval that you're looking at, you can always draw another division within it. You can always dichotomize it, that is, cut it in half. So given that, you will never actually cross that, that line at the end, and you'll never finish up with your path. The Achilles is actually very similar to this, except it has two different objects moving. One is Achilles, the fastest of runners back in the, you know, the host that attacked Troy. And then by convention, the other one is a turtle, quite slow, a tortoise, right? And so Achilles gives the tortoise a head start. He says, you know, I'm going to catch you sooner or later, so let's give you a really good head start. And then the, you know, the, the flag drops or the gun goes off and they start running, right? And the turtle doesn't run that far, and Achilles catches up to where the turtle started. But in that time, the turtle has moved on somewhat. 
He has crossed some territory. And now Achilles crosses that next territory where the tortoise was. And he almost catches him, but the tortoise has moved on as well. And we can keep doing this over and over again. By the time that he gets there, the tortoise has gone a little bit further. By the time that he gets there, the tortoise has gone yet a little bit further. And, you know, we can imagine these getting infinitesimally small. So Achilles will never catch the tortoise. The fastest runner will never catch the slowest runner. You can see that these are actually, according to, you know, Aristotle tells us, these are actually identical in the respect that they both have to do with traversing the same amount of space. So they're not really fundamentally different problems. The arrow is a, a different problem. This has to do with a, a sort of metaphysical issue of motion and rest. So imagine that you're shooting an arrow. At any given point in time, you've got the arrow and, you know, here it is. Um, there we go, good enough. So we're imagining it at a, a number of different points as it's flying, right? First it's here, then it's there, then it's there. At any given point that we think about it, um, the arrow occupies the same space that is equal to its size. But there's a problem. That is exactly what it means to be at rest, to be occupying a space for, you know, the brief duration of a moment. So while it's in motion, it's also at rest. It is at rest at every single point in its motion. That's paradoxical, isn't it? Because rest and motion are supposed to be opposites to each other. So that seems to be a bit of a problem. Um, if we go on a little bit further, the stadium is a little bit trickier, a little bit more complex. And we have to reconstruct it with a diagram sort of like this. Imagine trains. Um, that might be the easiest way to do it. Um, or cars or whatever it is that you want to do. The point is, is that you've got this length right here, A. And let's say these are spectators. And then you've got something moving. We call it B, and it's composed of points. And some of it overlaps with A. And then we also have a similar thing, C overlapping partly with A, not overlapping at all with B at the start, and moving in the opposite direction. Here's where the paradox arises according to Zeno. So B traverses two squares, let's call them, right? Two units. B is moving two units this way. C is moving two units this way. And that's in relation to A. But how much do B and C move in relation to each other? Four. So something is moving both two and four units at the same time. That seems to be a contradiction. A thing has to move the amount that it moves, right? It can't be moving double the amount that it's moving, because then it would just be moving double the amount that it was moving, and it would be moving at a different speed. So it seems like it's going at two different speeds or rates, covering two different amounts of ground, at the same time. Now, are there solutions to these? Yes, of course. Um, Aristotle himself says, you know, the claim, with the Achilles, the claim is that the slowest runner will never be caught by the fastest runner. Um, this is the same argument as the dichotomy with the difference that the magnitude remaining is not divided in half. We've seen that the argument entails the slow, slower runner is not caught, but this depends on the same point as the dichotomy. What is that point? In both cases, the conclusion it's impossible to reach a limit is a result of dividing the magnitude, the distance, in a certain way. But what's not being taken account of? Time. When you're going this far, it's taking that amount of time, and then it takes half the amount of time and half the amount of time. So sooner or later, you will, in fact, traverse the entire uh, length of the dichotomy. Sooner or later, Achilles will, in fact, catch the tortoise. That's not a big problem, right? When it comes to the arrow, um, he says that the conclusion depends on assuming that time is composed of nows, of moments, of moments that could be isolated apart from each other. And Aristotle says if you take that away, then the argument fails. 
It doesn't say that you have to take it away, but he says that if you do take it away, it fails. The stadium is a little bit more complicated. Um, he says that the result of the argument is that half a given time is equal to double the time. The mistake in his reasoning lies in supposing that it takes the same time for one moving body to move past a body in motion as it does for another to move past a body at rest, where both are the same size as each other and moving at the same speed, and this is false. So it, there's no problem once we actually bring time into it in accounting for that. It, this is just what it means for two bodies to be in motion in relation to each other. So each of these paradoxes is you know, an interesting little d discursus into um, you know, what it means to, to move and uh, you know, how distance would be involved and, and what happens when we take time out as a factor or we look at time in, in terms of moments in a kind of unusual way. Um, all of them fail as paradoxes, but they're all well worth looking at because we want to know why they don't work, not just that they don't work. And that tells us something a little bit about how motion, which you know Aristotle and so many other philosophers think is real, would in fact function. Um, so Parmenides, par, not Parmenides, uh, uh, he was his teacher, Zeno, is trying to make these arguments, of which we only have you know, a few, unfortunately, to support this notion that there is no change, there is no motion. But when, it you know, when we look at it, it turns out that there actually uh, can be motion, and these paradoxes as arguments fail.